Bullseye with Jesse Thorne is a production of MaximumFun.org and is distributed by NPR. It's Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. So there's a new novel out. It's called Red Pill. It's written by our next guest, Hari Kunzru. Red Pill is a little bit satire, a little bit of a comment on politics today. It's also a gripping thriller. Without giving up too much, here's the setup. The book's protagonist is an unnamed narrator. He's a writer in Brooklyn, married with kids. And in the back of his mind, he can't shake this feeling that something bad is about to happen. He doesn't know what. He doesn't know what he can do about it. But the growing terror is beginning to consume him. He gets a job in Berlin a writer's residency. The time alone only invites in more demons. Is he being watched? Is there an evil growing in the world? To the west, he sees Nazi ruins. To the east, the Stasi Museum. It sends him on a journey around the internet to reactionary message boards and old blogs. Then it sends him on a journey around the world, into stone huts in Scotland and Parisian hotels. And by the end of the book, you, the reader, start to wonder if his fears were justified. Now, obviously, this isn't light reading, but it's compelling. Our correspondent, Carrie Poppy, was taken by the book, so she was very excited to get to talk with its author. Here's Carrie Poppy's conversation with writer Hari Kunzru. Hari Kunzru, welcome to Bullseye. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, of course. So I've just finished your novel last night, so I'm still uh, in an anxiety spiral. (laughs) <laughs> um, so so th- this novel is about a, a male writer who uh, travels from New York to Germany for a writing fellowship in 2016. And I'm sure this is just a coincidence and you haven't even thought of it, but um, you're a male writer from New York who uh, went to Germany in 2016. And uh, our narrator actually experiences a psychological break while he's there. So my first question is, Hari, how are you doing? I'm I'm holding up okay, thanks. I think I can say that. Yeah, I mean, my experience in Germany wasn't exactly the uh, character in the novel's experience, but it was it was close enough. Um, I actually went with my wife and two year old mm. son, and so it wasn't the story of being away from home and kind of collapsing into a sort of psychological disaster. Um, mm-hmm. But it was. It was a strange time, actually, and it was it was a very cold time, mostly. I have to say, Berlin in winter has a kind of cold that even if you think you're hardened up by New York, you, know, you really haven't understood anything until that wind that sort of comes all the way from the Urals kind of starts piercing your outer clothing. <laughs> Uh, just cold in the physical sense, or was is there something sort of left over from history? You think that's sort of coloring your experience there? Well, that's also a thing about Berlin too. Is it is a city where it's very hard to escape history. It's present all around you, and you know you walk through the center of town through districts like Mitte, and you look up, and there are fifty cal machine gun bullet holes in the walls left over from the wall and you look down at the the street and there are little brass uh, cobblestones with the names of uh, Jews who were deported from particular buildings so you know you're always co- very conscious of that and where I was staying and where the book is set out in Vanze in the sort of western suburbs of Berlin there's a lot of echoes too I mean if people know that name it's because of the Vanze conference where the final solution was decided on in 1942. So it has a very sinister resonance from that point of view. But it's also got a lot of other historical aspects. It's the grave uh, of uh, the writer Heinrich von Kleist is there, who was uh, somebody who got very mixed up in, in my novel and in my experience of being there, 18th century writer who died by the lake in a suicide pact. He plays a very present role in the novel, um, sort of, I don't even think the word inspiring is quite right, but sort of <laughs> inspiring our narrator, um, sort of taking up purchase in his brain. I feel like um, I should apologize to you at this point. I feel like I've damaged you in some way. <laughs> oh, 
no, we're only a few minutes in. <laughs> You're listening to Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. Our guest is the writer Hari Kunzru. Hari, would you read from your book um, on page 171? We are uh, at a point where our narrator has met Anton, and perhaps you can describe who he is. So Anton is the guy we've been talking about. He's a uh, he's the showrunner of a show called Blue Lives, which is a which is a cop show. It's about this sort of special group of uh, of cops who have kind of become as bad as the the criminals they're supposed to be uh, chasing. Everybody is uh, involved in a kind of uh, high stakes competition with everybody else, and our nameless hero who thinks of himself as somebody who who wants to think about elevated things actually gets more and more obsessed with this view of the world and what it what it means the passage i'm about to read is uh starts with anton speaking and they're having a conversation about this kind of uh these characters who who do the dirty work for society go ahead call him names if it makes you feel better but you rely on him you know you do You fear and hate him for doing something that you can't do, that you secretly know has to be done. Society needs fear. It's our dirty little secret. The argument got confused. I said that what Carson did was morally wrong, and Anton accused me of being one of those people. So I asked what kind of people, and he told me, the kind who say morality when they mean politics, and politics when they mean morality. Most of what I call politics was, in his opinion, just squeamishness. There were people who acted, and people who wrung their hands and behaved as if they were going to act at some point in the future, once they'd sorted out what was moral and what wasn't. Their so-called morality was just paralysis. In truth, they delegated their power of action to others, men who weren't frozen rabbits, who could do what needed to be done. I told him he sounded like every other writer guy, secretly fretting that he wasn't a man of action. If he really wanted to be a fireman or whatever, why didn't he just go and fight fires instead of making TV shows? This uh, this passage really struck me because I think I feel a little indicted by it. <laughs> I think <laughs> it it is uh, quite easy to spend a lot of our time figuring out what the best thing to do is without ever getting to the best thing. I think that's so true. You know, the human condition is that we're always thrown into the middle of things. You know, we arrive in the middle of something pre-existing and we have to to kind of make our way, never really able to kind of clear a space and work out how to proceed before we proceed. Mm-hmm. And I think it may be a, a sort of disease of professional writers and talkers and commentators that we imagine that it would be possible to sort everything all out correctly before we did anything but in 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 truth you know life is very very messy so to that extent anton the the spokesman for the cynical man of action really has one over the narrator and this is a, a thing that happens sort of again and again in their relationship the the writer thinks he's sort of superior to this other guy that he's going to be able to uh, refute this view of the world but actually, he feels indicted himself. He feels very targeted by it. I want to talk to you a little bit about your writing process. When you started writing this novel, is this what you expected or uh, did it surprise you as it came about? I started before I went to Germany and the starting point for me was about the feeling of being watched. And I'm very interested in what the experience of surveillance does to our sense of self because, I mean, we have come to expect, as I say, that we're almost always at least potentially being watched. And that causes us to govern our behavior in certain ways. And privacy is is very central to to freedom in a certain way in that, I mean, we always have the choice when to come forward out of our privacy into the public sphere and what, you know, the, in theory, we should have the choice about sort of what expressions of ourself we make public and that we you know i think of privacy as a sort of um sort of sandbox really like where we can experiment and we can try things out and we can kind of work out what we feel about things without having to be judged by others but that space of privacy really is 
shrinking considerably. And I wonder what that does to our sense of ourselves as, as human agents and as free agents. Did you then, were you writing this as sort of a way of working those thoughts out or a therapeutic process? Or was it more, I have a message to get out? Look, I think every, I mean, certainly for me, every book has a kind of, has a public facing side and then a private facing side. I mean, I need to write a book. I'm often not sure quite why certain things go together or what the question is I'm trying to answer. But I mean, certainly I wanted to go through these feelings myself because I have a sort of anxious sense of the present moment. I have a sense that we're perhaps not actually catching up to the full consequences of the sort of technological and cultural changes that are happening. And into that situation, I, I wanted to put a character who's kind of quite like me, but is maybe a little more invested in certain slightly old fashioned kind of pompous writer stuff about uh, the the sort of nobility of his sort of poetic experience of the world. He's like, you know, he's a slightly parodic version of of me in that in that sense. And so I kind of started off just sort of experimenting with that character and kind of putting him into these situations. And then I mean, then Anton turned up as a sort of antagonist in the story, and I realised that there was a particular kind of force in the culture that I wanted to represent through Anton you know I mean there are a lot of Antons around there are you know especially on the internet I mean there you know you kind of come come up against Antonish thinking in all sorts of ways and it's a kind of battle that we're having in the culture at the moment between cynicism and idealism between certain Mm -hmm. sorts of feelings about the human about you know more broadly like what the meaning of things like human rights and empathy for others and especially uh, empathy for sort of distant people like uh, what does charity mean what who do to whom do we have obligations all these political questions that we're fighting out at the moment and they were you know through a novel you can kind of stage these things you can kind of you can set people going and, and listen to them talk to each other and try and step back as much as possible in some ways and 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 what happened to me when I was writing this was that Anton's point of view kind of became very forceful and so in Mm -hmm. a sense the writer at the center of it does find himself getting red pilled by Anton. We'll finish up with Hari Kunzru after a quick break stay with us it's Bullseye from MaximumFun.org and NPR. Hey, I'm Bria Grant, an e-reader who loves spoilers and chocolate. And I'm Mallory O'Mara, a print book collector who will murder you if you spoil a book for me. And we're the hosts of Reading Glasses, a podcast designed to help you read better. Over the past few years, we've figured out why people read. Self-improvement. Escapism. To distract ourselves from the world burning down. And why they don't. Not enough time. Not knowing what to read. And being overwhelmed by the number on their TBR list. And we're here to help you with that. We will help you conquer your TBR pile while probably adding a bunch of books to it. Reading glasses. Every week on MaximumFun.org. I'm Rodney Carmichael. I'm Sydney Madden. And on our new podcast, Louder Than a Riot, we trace the collision of rhyme and punishment in America. We were hunted by police. We were literally physically hunted. You'd be standing on the corner, drug squad pull up, everybody will run. New from NPR Music. Listen to Louder Than a Riot. It's Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. Our guest, Hari Kunzru, is an award-winning novelist. He's written the books Gods Without Men, Transmission, and the new book Red Pill, which is a thriller set in New York, Berlin, and the dark web. He's being interviewed by our friend Carrie Poppy. Carrie is the host of the Maximum Fun podcast, Oh No, Ross and Carrie. Let's get back into their conversation. Privacy is a is a major theme in this story, and uh, the main character comes to understand that he's being watched at the Deuter Center where he has this fellowship. But that actually becomes a sort of less profound form of surveillance that he's under because this this white supremacist, um, to put perhaps maybe not too fine a point on it, um, mm-hmm. uh, Anton. Uh, he has, as you said, sort of challenged his views, and now he's sort of living in his brain. And that becomes its own sort of form of surveillance. And it, it made me wonder what you think is is the biggest threat to our privacy this, these days. Is it these outside forces or things living inside us? 
well, I think it's it's a kind of unholy combination of both, to be honest. It's, um, I mean, at one point, uh, you know, I uh, I have the the central character quote this or, or sort of paraphrase this little bit of Jean Paul Sartre, and Sartre is thinking about privacy and thinking about freedom, and he says, "Imagine a peeping tom who's looking through a keyhole in a corridor." And as uh, as he's looking, he's totally focused on on the sort of sexy scene that he can see through the keyhole, and he's totally uh, comfortable with himself. And then, as soon as he hears a noise, as soon as he thinks someone else might be in the corridor observing him, all that uh, collapses, and he's terribly mm-hmm. conscious of himself, and he's terribly conscious of the shame of what he's doing. And so, I mean, Sartre writes something like, "All his freedom has an instantly been." ebbed away instantly sucked away and this is peeping tom or not this is this is the kind of consequence i'm interested in about that feeling of potentially being watched you know i mean i'm still not quite comfortable i won't i'm not at all comfortable with the idea that i go to my friend's houses and there's an alexa sitting there Mm. uh, open and online and that you know you say some word and suddenly a pizza appears (laughs) <laughs> and um you know or the or a SWAT team or whatever it is and mm. this kind of inhibition that comes from that i think is is a sort of has reduced the sphere of our freedom and of course a lot of this book i mean i i found i tend to write about doubles i have a weird thing about doubles then had i gone to therapy instead of writing books i might know what it was by now but i mean anton becomes a sort of psychic double of the of the narrator he's the sarcastic commentator the person who's the voice in the narrator's head who's laughing at him and his various attempts to make his way in the world so it becomes this sort of uh, dialogue where the real anton isn't there the real anton is elsewhere making his tv show but in, in, he's also, you know, as it gets put at one point in the book, he's living rent free in the narrator's head. He's become this a sort of almost like as a bit of the narrator's personality has kind of split off and become Anton and is constantly commenting and jeering. And I think that's a that's another thing about human freedom and about trying to kind of be in the world in a, a happy and comfortable way is that, you know, if you're acting for yourself and you're a uh, confident about that that's one thing but if you're acting because you think you're wishing to appear a certain way to the invisible audience of your actions you know we all have these kind of audiences these kind of the they that we think we're we're uh, in conversation with but um it's almost always a, a sort of negative uh, uh energy in our lives uh, well, it's interesting you mentioned opposites. I know you have, or, or I guess you didn't say opposites. You said more uh, twins. Um, but you have a new podcast that is about own. So, what draws you to that topic? Into the Zone is um, is a, yeah, it's a show about opposites and borders. I mean, I got very interested in the big kind of conceptual oppositions that we use to organise the world. You know, the life and death, public and private, native and migrant. These kind of ideas and i i got interested in whether they're always as really easily distinguishable as we think i mean the classic one is life and death if you ask a biologist to define life they can you know they can kind of get a certain way along with what a living thing needs to be able to do you know take in food grow and so on but an actual hard and fast definition of life is a very philosophically difficult thing there is a sort of gray area and right now in the world of course we're living completely in that gray area because the sort of thing that sits right on that border is a virus you know a virus Mm. is not fully alive because it needs the reproductive mechanism of its host cells in order to make copies of itself so it's neither not living or quite living it's an uncanny thing that kind of lives in that gray area um and yeah, I mean, in a lot of these stories that I tell in the podcast are kind of personal stories as well. I end up at Stonehenge asking whether I could be a druid, whether my Indianness precludes me from a certain sort of English national identity. And uh, and I do. There's a there's an episode where I revisit some of the uh, some of the stuff from Berlin. I mean, you mentioned very briefly that uh, there's a character who used to be a punk musician uh, in the 80s in East Berlin. And one of the things I found out in Berlin was that the Stasi, the secret police, were 
absolutely terrified of the uh, of the emerging kind of teenage punk movement in the early 80s and they devoted a lot of energy to sort of squashing it they were convinced it was a sort of western plot to undermine the state and so i went back and i i, I found one of the sort of first generation of east german punks who was sort of 16 and just he would get arrested every time he walked out of his house for having spiky hair and uh ripped clothes and he you know he told me about this kind of cat and mouse game he played with his stasi interrogator and why the interrogator thought he was a much more sophisticated political creature than he actually was and then accidentally started giving him this education in anarchism and all these other dissident political philosophies so that's a that's a fascinating story and that is about what happens when the state tries to kind of reduce your sphere of privacy so it was another way of kind of going over the same sort of material that's in the novel. So there's there's so much dialogue these days, or at least many monologues these days, <laughs> about, uh, about whether we should engage with people who have extremist views, right? And your book seems like an argument sort of for both positions. Uh, you know, the main character is exposed to this so, sort of social Darwinian viewpoints and that grows inside inside him like a virus but also the the white supremacist character anton is sort of emboldened and strengthened by having been rejected by a certain segment of society mm. um so i'm curious where you fall in that conversation well as you say um as you detected i, I mean i i'm sort of both sides on that really i mean i think there's a sort of dignity that we confer on marginal and extreme people by getting too worked up about them and profiling them in the New York Times. I mean, there was a period where I, which was I found just profoundly annoying when it seemed to be, you know, I couldn't open uh, my browser without finding another major publication who tracked down some little dude from the traditionalist workers party and was asking him in all seriousness about whether he thought six million people died in the in the shower and i mean that is a sort of elevation by the media for the sake of kind of titillating the readers with you know look here's a real life nazi check him out and that does no service to anybody because they're they're not serious people and they they don't deserve that kind of attention. Having said that, there's been a failure to engage certain sorts of ideas online. And I think that has given those ideas a kind of currency and an oxygen. And by, by that, I mean that there's a sort of mainstream liberal position that, for example, race is not real and any appeal to to race is uh, automatically out of bounds and mm. that position is kind of more you know you look at actual kind of contemporary genetics and it's all a bit more complicated than that and the fact that uh, the sort of dis rather slightly ignorant dismissal by humanities types in the media has opened a space where kind of opportunist people on the right can say oh the mainstream media is lying to you they're suppressing the truth they're suppressing certain sorts of ideas and you know i think it is important to at least learn what the positions there are and what kind of arguments are being put forth uh from the from the far right i mean i've i mean ever since i got an internet connection which is a very long time ago i have sort of had a you know an occasional I've, I, I don't know I don't want to call it a hobby I know it's not really a hobby but it's, it's, I, I, I lurk on far right sites mm. and and read their material and actually you know if they're referencing some book or some uh, set of ideas I go and take a look and my sense of it is that there has been a kind of massive growth in the sort of vibrancy of what you would call far right culture in the last decade or so when i was you know starting out doing this in the 90s i mean it was just a, it was a fairly tired old set of tropes and these kind of skinhead types banging on about rudolf hess and uh you know and then and the nazis and sort of i mean all this you know the same stuff that had been around for years and was very worn out and was very kind of unlikely to uh you know recruit many new people to the cause and then you know cut to 
2015 and you have this sort of meme culture and this pose of sort of fun ironic you know they were the ones with the jokes and the and the libs were the crying ones who uh you know who had no sense of humor and who were triggered by uh you know the slightest challenge to their worldview and all this has kind of grown up in a space where there has been a, a a sort of absence of of address and an, an absence of of kind of visibility for I think for a lot of especially disaffected young men who've turned to this ideology as a way of of kind of framing their their lives. Uh, well, I hate to end it there. So <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's let's think right. of a cheery last question. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's your favorite animated movie? Oh, well, I'm a Miyazaki fan. That's for that's for sure. So I'll say Spirited Away. Oh, wonderful choice. <laughs> Hari Kunzru, thank you for being on Bullseye. Oh, thank you so much. Hari Kunzru, interviewed by Carrie Poppy. Red Pill is the name of his new novel. Hari is also hosting a new podcast called Into the Zone, where he talks about Stonehenge, the history of surveillance states, and, of course, Lil Nas X. Carrie Poppy, our interviewer, hosts the podcast Oh No, Ross and Carrie, a very special show where she and her co-host Ross Blotcher investigate spiritual and paranormal claims by doing them. They've joined Scientology, drank alchemical potions. They even took an ice bath. That's the end of another episode of Bullseye. Bullseye is produced out of the homes of me and the staff of Maximum Fun in and around greater Los Angeles, California, where my nine-year-old daughter has decided to start freezing plastic spiders into ice cubes. Got to remember the reason for the season. Our producer is Kevin Ferguson, Jesus Ambrosio, and Jordan Cowling are our associate producers. We get help from Casey O'Brien. Our interstitial music is by Dan Wally, also known as DJW. Our theme song is by The Go Team, thanks to that wonderful band and their label, Memphis Industries, for letting us use their music on our show. You can also keep up with the show on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Just search for Bullseye with Jesse Thorne, and I think that's it. Just remember, all great radio hosts have a signature sign-off. Bullseye with Jesse Thorne is a production of MaximumFun.org and is distributed by NPR.